Thanks for stopping by. So a few years ago, um, uh, some researchers at Stanford University did a study. And in this study, what they did is they compared high school students and professional fact checkers. And they gave them a piece and they asked them th to verify that information and analyze its credibility. And what they found is that the students, they read closely, right? They took one text and they just looked at that text and examined that text for credibility, thinking about the ethos of the author, kind of looking for things like who published it, um, what was the domain name, et cetera. Um, and what they found was that when they looked at professional fact checkers, that they did something a little bit different. They did that close reading strategy, but they were mostly looking at it in a distant way. They were using the power of the network to see how verifiable and how legit this information was. They were essentially kind of looking for receipts in the parlance of the internet at this moment. So I'm going to uh, use an example, um, and this is going to be an example from this book, Transgender History by Susan Stryker. Um, and in this book, um, Susan Stryker makes a claim about um, something called the uh, Compton's Cafeteria Riots in 1966 in the uh, Tenderloin uh, District of San Francisco. And um, what Stryker says is that for the first time um, at this riot, um, direct action in the streets by transgender people resulted in lasting institutional change. And that was in 1966. Now, we might think about, wow, 1966, that was actually a few years before Stonewall. Is that really true that, you know, there was a, a transgender liberation riot in San Francisco in 1966? So, you know, if we were questioning that idea, or even if we wanted to learn more about that, they're like, I never heard about that. I just want to learn more about that. Well, of course, right in the notes um, at the end of the book, right, we're going to have citations for that. Um, so we have three citations here. Um, one is um, from another book. Another is from a documentary um, called The Riot at Compton's Cafeteria. Um, and another is um, from uh, Movements and Memory, The Making of a Stonewall Myth, which was published in the American Sociological Review. So I have kind of three things here, and that's really what's called going upstream. When we're going upstream, we're starting with an original text, and we're finding the citations, following the citations to see where did Stryker get her information about this riot. So that way we can go and we can verify the information in there. Um, in those other prior previous sources. And so by looking for prior work and seeing what are the things that the original text is citing, it does two things. It allows us to verify the information and it also allows us to expand our network to bring in other texts to get more information. Now that's going upstream. Um, the other move that researchers did is that they looked laterally. And I like to think of laterally kind of like as a bookshelf, right? Put those texts all up against um, each other or put your original text against up against other texts. And so what they found is that fact checkers, um, they didn't just go upstream, but they sought out other texts that weren't even connected to the original ones on the same topic so that they be could begin to verify that information to see whether it corresponds with other texts. So imagine let's take, you know, um, this book um, as our original text and we want to see, well, can we find support for this claim in other books out there? Um, so yes, we can. Right. So one of those claims is also um, in Michael Bronsky's A Queer History of the United States. Um, there's also another one, uh, actually several times it's mentioned um, in this book, uh, Transgender Studied Readers, which is an edited collection which has kind of multiple essays within it. So one of the things that I like to think about when we're reading laterally is we're kind of just like reading them kind of like on a bookshelf, where what we're doing is we're comparing this text with these other texts. And we can, you know, kind of go on multiple different ways. Um, so that's how that looks in print. Let's see how this looks in the digital world and dive into the screen. I'm going to start with this opinion piece, The Right Way to Fight Fake News, that was published um, in March 2020 in the New York Times newspaper of record. And I'm going to show you how I went both upstream um, and also lateral. So let's start with the opinion piece itself. And I have my hypothesis out because um, I took some annotations before. 
So um, the first thing, I'm just going to kind of do just a quick check of the rhetorical situation. I'm going to understand, all right, who are the writers? Um, and I kind of looked them up. And it was interesting because by looking them up, I found that they're both from business schools. Um, and one has cognitive science expertise. And this actually tells me a little bit about their motivation and perspective. It also tells me that they're not journalists, that these are academics writing for a general audience. So this tells me that actually what they're trying to do is take the work that they've done in academia and explain it to the New York Times audience. So they don't write for the New York Times um, very often. They may This may be their only time that they have, but they're writing it for this occasion, right, to get this idea out into the public. And the New York Times has decided that this is appropriate uh, to publish. And so this is also, I'm here, I'm looking at the opinion here, and this is telling me that this is an opinion. Right? So this is by nature, this is bias. Pennycock and Rand are making an argument and they want us, um, they want to persuade us of something. They're not being unbiased here. That doesn't mean that they're not being factual, right? Um, that there's a big distinction here. They have an agenda, right? But they're also using facts to support their agenda. Um, I'm getting a good sense when I'm reading an op-ed, what the title is, what the kind of main argument is. And so I think, you know, here what they're saying is that their general argument is that um, they're for regulation of social media platforms, but that they say that a lot of the strategies that they're currently using are not working and that we need to develop better strategies through more um, studies. Um, and so they did their own study. And um, the first kind of um, claim that they make in their article is that one of the strategies that platforms like YouTube and Facebook and Twitter have used is to provide information about a news source, right? Um, to say, you know, where did the source of information come from? And what they found is that, well, yeah, that makes sense, right? That to say a source is from the New York Times rather than the Santa Cruz Sentinel um, is going to lend, is going to allow the audience to know, okay, I maybe, you know, can trust the ethos of the New York Times a little bit more because they're a bigger organization um, and they have better um, fact checkers or opinion pieces or whatever. Um, but what they found is that that, that actually had no impact when uh, social media platforms did that. And so here we have a link um, to actually the study that the writers of this article did. Um, so when you click on this link, and this is kind of what going upstream is, it's, this is essentially a citation, and you're following that citation by clicking a link to um, this piece. So let me just get to um, the top of it so you can see. Um, and so um, this article, which is published in the Harvard Kennedy School Misinformation Review, um, is telling us um, about um, the study that the writers of this op-ed opinion piece did. Um, and so we can see that study. Um, and so we can get all of that about the study. We can even get more um references here so that we can find more information about other studies around that. So we can start to check and see, all right, how are these sources kind of linking to each other? And is the information these sources, um, is it strong in terms of the links it has, especially within discourse communities? So I'm looking here, I'm seeing the discourse communities are kind of journalism, political science, um, cognition, um, media studies, etc. So let's take another claim here. They say another one of the things that um, seems like a good idea but doesn't really work is to provide um, warnings that fake news exists and to offer tips about spotting misinformation. And so they talk about um, a Facebook campaign that said fake news is not your friend, just like in um, the, the image at the top. And they found that the research suggests that such tactics can be counterproductive since they reduce confidence in all news and have that kind of backfire effect. And so if we click on this, it takes us not to a study that they did, but to a study by um, other people, right? And so we have the researchers here, um, this study, um, Real Solutions for Fake News, measuring the effectiveness of general warnings and fact check tags and reducing belief in false stories, um, shows that these strategies did actually not work very well. Um, and so we have another study that's kind of, you know, supporting the claim that the original writers of the op-ed have made. 
Now, one of the things about going upstream that's really great is that we can actually continue to go upstream. So we have found ourselves on an academic peer reviewed article. I just wanna make a point that the only way I was get able to get to it from the New York Times website and actually access it is because my VPN is connected. If it wasn't and I wasn't didn't have off-campus access to the library, I wouldn't actually be able to even access this document. Um, so um, one of the claims that is made here, which just really um, you know the, the, it stuck out for me because it seemed to be so contrary to what I had thought before, which is that although false news most likely did not change the election's outcome, its prevalence is an important concern. I was like, wait, what? Fake news did not change the 2016 election's outcome because there was so much kind of discussion of that. Um, so you know, I clicked on that, um, which again brought me to another study, um, and this study from the Journal of Economics Perspectives um, shows that actually it seemingly did not. And when I actually look at um, the references and the full piece in here, I find that actually there's a lot of support for the claim that um, fake news in, uh, in social media in the 2016 election didn't really make the kind of major difference of who won. Um, and so I think that was you know a really interesting thing that I just found by going upstream. So upstream isn't just about verifying, um, it can also really be about discovering new things and expanding your network of sources. And so as we can see here, right, I went, you know, once upstream in just this one article, I could keep going, you know, as long as I want, right, because everything's kind of going to be linked together. Um, and so here I kind of went two steps, I could go a third. I think a good idea is to go at least two steps. Um, to see kind of where it did the information of this information um, come from. It's kind of like a food chain in that way. And we can see how ideas get from here to here to here and how they wind up here, which is great for research. It's also great for kind of seeing, is this really a strong argument? Um, is this a persuasive argument? Is this a factual argument? Um, is this an ethical argument that's not trying to manipulate us or to bullshit us um, to believe something? So that's kind of going um, upstream. Now, if I want to go lateral, I, it's less about following source trails than finding other sources on the topic. So let's take a look at some other sources. Um, and I want to start with some newspapers of record. And I saw that this piece in the Washington Post um, is an opinion piece uh, by Nina Jankowicz uh, for 2018, who says that it's time to start regulating Facebook. Um, and um, she kind of lays out strategies, some of which which actually contradict um, the piece that we just looked at. Um, some of the things that she says they should do, um, studies show that they don't work. So we'd have to kind of grapple um, with that idea. Um, the other um, one that I found um, was the dark side of regulating uh, speech on Facebook um, in another opinion piece from the Washington Post, arguing that actually there's a lot of things that could backfire and that are dangerous, which kind of um, it supports some of the things in the original op opinion piece that I was looking at. And it also um, contradicts some other things. So I'd have to make a kind of educated decision about how those relate to each other. Um, and then finally, in the Wall Street Journal, um, I found this opinion piece um, by, um, well, the CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, who's arguing that, um, you know, in a democracy, a private company should not have the power to censor politicians or the news, saying that it's too difficult um, for Facebook and not Facebook's role or responsibility to do that. And in some ways, that backs up the original piece by Penny Cook and Rand in their argument saying that we need evidence-based strategies because these companies don't really know how to do it um, very well. And so we see here that you know Mark Zuckerberg is, is essentially admitting our, our company doesn't know how to do it well and we don't want to do it, even though that maybe contradicts um, Penny Peck and Rand because they do think that Facebook should be doing something. So, you know, maybe this is kind of getting a little bit confusing to us because we have all of these different perspectives, um, but this is something where we want to start using our good distant reading strategies to start to synthesize the ideas and see the different perspectives so that we can come up with our own argument um, and own ideas about where, how we feel about this issue. Um, so one of the things that we may do is start to look for other types of sources that are maybe a little bit more in depth. 
So we've already kind of found some peer-reviewed um, studies. They may be a little bit more advanced for us than maybe we want at the moment. So another good place to go is to kind of um, long read journalism from um, you know, magazine type places, um, or even newspapers like newspapers of records like the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, etc., um, that will kind of give us a longer, more complex view from a reporting perspective. So stuff that is not about making an argument. And this piece by Lincoln Kaplan, Lincoln Kaplan is um, is a Yale law professor um, telling, go walking us through a kind of longer, more complex piece about what are some of the legal issues um, and some of the studies showing on whether or not Facebook and Twitter and social media should be regulated um, by the government under these um, conditions. Um, and so, you know, that is going to kind of help us really kind of understand, right, what are the issues and what are the facts here and whether this original piece is something that is at least legitimate and is based on legitimate um, quality information. And we can see how it relates to these other sources, right? Two opinion pieces and more, um, and one more um, reporting piece that is less biased. Um, so one more thing is that, you know, if we're running into paywalls as we're doing this work, um, you know, there are a bunch of newspaper databases on the library website. Uh, in this class, I'm going to give you kind of a few. Um, there's many because they search different types of newspapers, but the one um, that you might use for going upstream and lateral is actually these two here, News and Newspapers Collection um, by ProQuest. I think that's my favorite one. And Newspaper Source uh, from EBSCOhost is also pretty good as well. There are ones for specific publications like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. However, News and Newspaper Selection is going to give you kind of all of those, as you can see here, is going to have a lot of newspapers and records, as well as kind of smaller newspapers um, and more niche newspapers. So it's kind of a really good collection. It's going to be much more helpful than Google News. And also, you're going to be behind um, the library paywall. So even though it's not going to look the same as this, um, you will be able to get the text of that piece. So as you can see, Upstream and lateral reading really does a couple of things. It allows you to verify information by seeing how well is it connected and supported by other things in the textual network. It also allows you to grow the textual network. It allows you to find more sources by going upstream. It allows you to do more searching to find other sources so that you can compare it with the original source that you're looking. So as you are verifying, it is actually expanding that network, bringing in kind of more things to that network so you have a more comprehensive view of how well that information um, is credible, but also how it fits in a larger context. Thanks for your time.